Okay, if you are ready. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I welcome you to a tea time with NCATS Acting Director, Dr. Joni Rudder. Uh, we hope that you are all engaged and ready for a discussion today that will be moderated by our, our guest moderator, Esther Crowfall. Uh, before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping items. If we can go to the next slide, please. So just for everybody's notification, this is a recorded public event. And when we are finished with the event, we will place the recording on our NCATS events webpage. Uh, we have two, two sets of uh, guests here. We have a set of panelists that we have invited. And I will send out a reminder to you all, but um, during until we get to the discussion, please mute yourselves when you're not speaking. If you would like to have, if you do want to have a, a question or a comment that you would like to ask, please go to uh, and press the raise your hand function on the bottom of your, your Zoom window um, or type your questions or comments if you want to send something to other panelists in the, in the discussion you can put those in the chat box, but please raise your hand if you have a question or comment you would like to, to bring forward in the discussion. We also have a general audience that are uh, who are joining us today, and we encourage you to please submit your questions in the Q&A box at any time during this event. If your questions are specific to some of our programs or activities here at NCATS, we actually have uh, some subject matter experts that are joining us from NCATS on the call today, and they can answer your questions in real time. Um, and we will also float some of some of the questions from the general audience up to Esther for the discussion later today. So we're looking forward to an engaging conversation. Next slide, please. Here's our agenda today. I've taken my two minutes, um, and I will. It will be followed with some remarks by Dr. Rudder. And then Esther will lead us in a discussion, not with Dr. Rudder, but actually with you, our panelists and our, and our uh, pa other participants. Joni will close us up with a call to action and then we will adjourn. So with no further ado, I would like to hand this over to Dr. Rudder. Next slide. All right, actually you can keep it on this slide if you wouldn't mind, Sean. Um, I, I'll just wanna get us, started real quick. I, I wanted to say that I, I didn't know whether to call it a TEA time, tea time, or a TEE -E time. So I did bring a golf club and my teas just so that we cover all the bases. Um, but thank you, Penny. I really appreciate you opening it up today. And, and, and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our very first NCATS tea time. Um, and I, I want to tee things off with a huge thank you to every one of you just for being here today. I really am humbled and um, excited about the great turnout that we have. And I'm, I'm honored to be in the company of, of such an exceptional panel of stakeholders and audience members to have this discussion today. You all represent the entire translational science team spectrum from rare disease advocates to community educators and science thought leaders to patient supporters, clinicians, researchers, and uh, to uh, you're, you're all champions of translational science. And I thank you for your dedication to leading the change, improving health and saving lives. And I'm excited to see so many familiar faces too. And, and I also see many new ones as well. And I hope that we have a chance to, uh, to engage at some point. Um, this is exactly what today is all about, nurturing existing relationships and building new partnerships and finding ways of working together to make the whole of what we do greater than the sum of our parts. And collectively, I, I believe, and I think you probably do as well, that we can achieve pretty big advances in biomedical research that will have lasting impacts on the communities and the individuals that we serve. And so while our tea is steeping, and I'm going to keep using puns throughout, I think, but uh, apologies for that. But while our tea is steeping for our moderated discussion, I'm going to go ahead and take a few moments to give a brief high level view of what NCATS is, who we are, and talk about my vision for the decade ahead. And so on our NCATS website, we have our, our full mission, which is to catalyze the generation of innovative methods and technologies that will enhance the development testing and implementation of diagnostics and therapeutics across a wide range of human disease and condition. And if you go to the next slide, Sean, um, 
that that full mission is is kind of a mouthful. So I, I I also like to simplify it a little bit as well. I like to think of our mission as really turning basic science observations into health solutions through translational science. And if you go to the next slide, we accomplish our mission using a two pronged approach that requires you sort of to understand and, and also talk about the distinction between translational research and translational science. And so I've tried to depict this here on this slide I, using an actual pipeline um, because it's typically depicted as a pipeline because advancing research projects to the next step is dependent on successfully completing the step for it. So it's sort of an evolutionary way that we advance uh, research projects through the translational science or translational research pipeline. And so, for example, I've tried to call this out a little bit on the on the graphic here of the pipeline. For example, in preclinical development, we do what are called investigational new drug or IND enabling studies to generate the evidence that's going to be required to file for an IND status before doing a cl clinical trial on that investigational new drug. So moving from the preclinical development to a phase one clinical trial is one of those steps in this translational research pipeline. It's, and it's a particularly arduous one fraught with many barriers. And, and that's why we really need translational science. And so if you do one click, Sean, um, I, I wanna just highlight what then translational science is, which is the field of investigational investigation focused on understanding the scientific and operational principles underlying each step of the translational research process so that we can establish principles that might be predictive for our success in moving along this uh, translational research pipeline. Or it can help us find and address the crimps in this therapy development pipeline that will enable us to do science better, do it faster, do it cheaper, in more of a revolutionary kind of fashion. So in this, in this, uh, in this slide here, if A represents basic science and B represents health solutions, then arrows going in determine the flow rate and the openness of that pipe is what is really what determines the flow rate. So bottlenecks can slow the translational research processes. And, and, and these are things like operational issues or administrative issues or financial hurdles or even scientific issues. And that's why it's not always just about the science in terms of, of how we can do things more effectively and efficiently. But all of these things are in our purview to address. And so that's why we need to work together to help address them. But if we do address them, we can effectively speed up the process to get from point A to point B uh, much better. And so with, with this translational science strategy, our driving hope is to bring more treatments to all people more quickly. And in fact, I've turned this hope into NCATS's three audacious goals that I want to highlight for today. And if you can go to the next slide, please. Now, I'm not going to outline all of the objectives underlying these goals, mainly for two reasons. One, we, we need a lot more time to discuss them. <clears throat> but the second one is that I, I very much want to capture your imagination and incorporate input from, your, from, from our community together as we start to develop and finalize these key objectives that we can turn into more measurable and concrete advances. And so this meeting is, a, is about starting this, this conversation and um, it's not the only one. I, I, I hope that we'll have a lot more opportunity to, to weigh in on these. But essentially the three audacious goals are shown here. More treatments. We want more, five times more treatments in the pipeline. We wanna improve the process for turning research into therapies, enable the development and use of new platform-based technologies and approaches, and build better predictive models that better mimic the human physiological processes that will help us move forward. I want to, um, to increase inclusivity in research to improve health for all, so that's all people. And that means training the next generation of diverse translational science workforce <clears throat> to improve commercial interest and market incentives for rare disease and patient-centric approaches that we really need. We need better patient-centric study designs to be able to do this. And then, of course, expanding community engagement efforts across the board. And then the last one more quickly. I want to reduce by half the time for diagnostics and therapeutics to reach patients, to accelerate the pace it takes for treatments to get to patients, doing things like expanding our efforts and repurposing uh, therapeutics, and employ a many diseases at a time strategy. 
And doing many of these things will help us shorten the diagnostic odyssey that we see so much in certainly the rare disease space. So these goals are, are aspirational at this point, but, but they're also attainable. And I think that these are the kinds of things that will help guide us into the next decade and keep us focused really on that mission of turning biological observations into health solutions. And ensuring that we are in lockstep with the larger community and the whole ecosystem really together, it's hugely important uh, for us to succeed and, and work together to figure out how to make that happen better. And of course, um, if you go to the next slide, we, we all know that many hands make, many hands make light, light work, especially when they represent diverse perspectives and diverse expertise. And so in order to succeed, I think we really need to help build and strengthen relationships across the board with our partners, our advocates, and our scientific community, and generate more excitement and support from that community to demonstrate our impact and to disseminate our successes that we can have together. We've done this uh, certainly over the past decade and, and doing more of this in the decade to come is going to be incredibly important. And then of course, raising that awareness on the Hill um, is something that, that we need your help with as well. So team science, collaborations, partnerships, these are all critical for NCATS' success. And we can't do this alone. We really need your help. And what we need, for example, are answers for the 30 million people who have one of the 7 to 10,000 rare diseases, where we spend over $400 billion on direct medical costs on rare diseases because we don't have enough answers. But what we do have is an amazing community of stakeholders patients and advocates and clinicians and researchers, many of whom are on this call today. And so we have this incredible resource. We also have incredible tools and technologies that are ripe for us to use. We have three audacious goals that we can build from. And together, I think that we can make this difference. I, I'm very excited to hear more from you about what we can do together to leverage our strengths even more, to bring more treatments to all people more quickly. So this tea time is about what we can do to put some meat on the bones with these three audacious goals. Um, what are the key milestones and metrics that you think are going to be really important to do so to make sure that we're on the right track? What ideas do, uh, do you have to help prioritize the objectives within the vision and even add to it? And there's no better way to have this discussion with, with, uh, than with Esther Krofa here leading, leading the way and uh, taking over the reins. So um, Esther, I'm, I'm privileged to have you here today. You're, you've been a wonderful partner and a longtime supporter of NCATS. Um, Esther Krofa is the Executive Director of Faster Cures and the Center for Public Health at the Milken Institute. And I often think of the Milken Institute and Faster Cures as the .org to the NCATS's.gov. Um, so it's a wonderful partnership. And Esther has such deep experience in the government, in nonprofit and for-profit sectors, where she has led efforts to bring together diverse stakeholders um, to solve critical issues and to achieve shared goals that improve the lives of patients. So uh, I, I can't think, of, again, of anyone better to help lead this conversation. So Esther, I'm now going to turn it over to you. And thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you so much, uh, Joni, for one, your comments uh, overall and your remarks in terms of your goal, goals, the audacious goals for NCATS, the mission of NCATS, and uh, certainly our partnership with NCATS so over uh, the many years. Much of what you say resonates so directly with us that um, we can certainly copy and paste that and make that the Faster Cures mission statement as well. I'm delighted to be here with such a diverse group of stakeholders who are quite focused again on achieving that mission. This is the portion of the agenda where we want an, a very robust conversation. And I know that you all here are not shy uh, in terms of weighing in on those goals because the goals that Joni just outlined are not just for NCATS, they're about the overall community as I and many of you have been reflecting over the last 24 months, what we just experienced in the course of the pandemic shows us what is possible. And we've known this as a community for quite a long period of time. The challenge is the will. How do we bring together all of our collaborative efforts in order to achieve those shared goals? And this is an opportunity for us as we think about the 10 year goals for NCATS, what are those elements within the three that resonate for you? What, are, what is missing from your perspective? And how do you want to partner 
with NCAS and the broader community as we go forward. What we're going to do over the next 25 minutes is to have a conversation with all of us. So I welcome everyone to come back on camera, raise your hand because we want to hear from all of those stake groups of stakeholders that Joni talked about when she introduced this section. And certainly we're going to also include those who are joining us from the general audience, the general public as well to weave in their comments and their reactions into the course of this conversation. And so please go ahead and start, raise your hand, use the raise the hand function if you have a comment that you want to share. And particularly the way that we want to have this conversation are around those questions that I laid out. One, what resonated for you in the context of the vision that Joni shared? What are your biggest concerns? And what are your priorities as you've reflected not only on the last two years, but on the mission of NCATS, the mission of your organization in the context of translational science. So why don't we begin there and get some feedback and get some reactions. I do want to begin, if that's possible, with Charlene Son Rigby, who is joining us for just a brief moment of time before she logs off, if you don't mind kicking us off with just some of your reflections. Thank you, Charlene. Oh, thank you, Esther. Um, uh, well, I have to say I'm really excited and appreciative of being included in this forum. Um, so I'm coming to this um, as both a uh, potential solution provider as well as a rare disease parent. So um, I am uh, the CEO of RareX, where we are building a platform to collect data, patient reported data uh, cross disorder for rare diseases. And I have an eight year old who has an STXBP1 uh, disorder as well, a rare neurodevelopmental disorder. And um, you know, so uh, I was very excited um, when uh, Dr. Ritter, you presented your, your BHAG via the audacious goals, because from, from my perspective as you know, someone in a community where there's you know, so such significant unmet need, and it's true you know, kind of across the, the rare disease spectrum, um, you know, the thing I am always thinking about is how can we, you know, the bottleneck that you presented, how do we increase the throughput? And, you know, it's been very exciting to see, you know, some of these, you know, projects that have been coming out, you know, the, the RDCRN, you know, also the, um, uh, the gene therapy uh, program that was announced last year. But the question is, is how do we move from these individual um, uh, disorders to really fully scaling to platform, um, you know, technologies and, and being able to, um, you know, I guess, adopt that at scale. So that's one of my, you know, my questions, because that's a, a real structural shift. Right, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Charlene, for sharing your reflections. And I think we're all motivated by that same sentiment, which is both the solution provider, but also having that lived experience and the idea of what can we do faster for more, many disease conditions at the same time is certainly an idea that I know that many of us share, particularly with what are the next types of innovations we need on different kinds of platforms that ought to be developed and certainly as a component of the vision Joni shared as well. All right, let me see if there are other raised hands. And while, oh, fantastic. Um, while I wait for the raised hands and Heidi, I see you. I do also wanna welcome Christina Hartman, who is at the Alliance for Regenerative Medicines to offer her reactions and comments as well, particularly when we talk about the pipeline for cell and gene therapies that can solve for many of these challenging diseases. Christina? Let's see if she's still here with us. I saw her come in a little bit earlier. Okay, while we wait for Christina, why don't we go to you, Heidi, and then we'll give her a chance to log back in. Thanks so much, Esther. Appreciate the opportunity. I'm really excited about this vision, Dr. Rudder. We are thrilled by it. Your ambitious goals are Nord's ambitious goals as well, faster treatments, more of them available for an, un, you know, an underserved community oftentimes. And so we are looking forward to partnering with NCAS to help fulfill this ambitious agenda. And then I will also say that one thing that I was excited to see as you're outlining is how do we increase, Nord, or, uh, increase NCAS and Nord's presence on Capitol Hill and making sure that we are drawing appropriate distinctions with everyone's enthusiasm around ARPA-H, 
which we share as well, but making sure there's still space for the great work that NCAS is doing and that those agendas are running in parallel and mutually supportive and engaging with one another where appropriate, but that the enthusiasm around ARPA-H doesn't take away from NCAS' tremendous work. Thank you so much, Heidi. And I, if you don't mind, if I can follow up with you just really quickly on that, are there particular suggestions that you would have for how to create that distinction more clearly? Because in, in terms of engaging with policymakers, it can be challenging to describe what translational science is and then to describe what a potential new agency may or may not do differently from what NCAT. So, you know, not to put you on the spot, but any ideas or recommendations, Heidi? No, Esther, I mean, it's exactly what you said. It is to draw those distinctions and show those parallels. And so I think UARD looks forward to finding opportunities to do that, whether that's through field briefings or one-on-one -on -one engagements with members and key staff. I think that as ARPA-H comes more fully into form, just making sure that we are maintaining that space, that critical space that NCAS has within this research and development platform. And so I think We've got a lot of different patient advocacy groups on this call, and I think we're looking forward to working together to make sure that um, the enthusiasm for ARPA-H is, um, doesn't overshadow the great work that NCAS is doing. So, you know, as we identify ways through the briefings or meetings or other platforms, um, we look forward to partnering and supporting those. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heidi. Those are great ideas. Other, other thoughts? What is missing? What are your priorities in the context of these three goals? And I know that many of you are working on specific initiatives that we would love to hear. What are you working on that may not be included in what you just heard in terms of the vision? And Dale Dirks, why don't I go to you next? Thank you. I didn't realize you were going to come to me so fast. I was going to get my <laughs> thoughts together, but uh, I think I, I think I do have them. And I'm uh, a little hampered by the fact that I have to jump off at two o'clock, so I appreciate you recognizing me uh, early. Uh, we have talked about this before with the, the previous director about the potential, uh, you know, and, and the, the question, what is missing? What, what should NCATS do differently or more of to help its presence on the Hill? One of the things that we talked uh, about, but it never really caught fire, was that was a Friends of NCATS, um, a formal ad hoc group. Um, that would meet periodically and uh, strategize about things that we could do collectively to feature the importance of what the NCATS is doing. And it, it's not unusual for a institute or center at NIH to have a friends of, and I've, I'm thinking of the NIAMS coalition, uh, the NHLBI constituency group, friends of NIDDK um, and others uh, that uh, meet periodically. It's an external group. Uh, we all work in the best interest of the Institute to feature uh, strong things that they're doing to, um, you know, get uh, people on the Hill and in the federal agencies advised of the important mission and uh, activities of the Institute or Center. Something to think about. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dale, and, and agreed, which in, in terms of how the community itself can participate in that engagement on the Hill when you have a formal forum or groups of individuals organized to talk about and to educate both the public but also and policymakers, it's always a bit easier to get the mission across in a much more clear way. Uh, thank you so much, Dale. And I want to look for other comments, any other comments as they come through. Do you agree? with what you have heard. Do we need a friends of NCAT? So I'm curious if there are other thoughts here as well. And I see one that came in, is it through Q&A, Penny, that you wanna read off? Uh, yes, so this is from Lloyd Michener. It says, coming from the community engagement perspective, I think we have a wonderful window to help NCATs and the CTSA hubs deepen their engagement with community groups. Uh, excuse me. Um, including rural, so that groups, including patients, caregivers, community leaders, practice groups are more engaged in the design and oversight of clinical research in implementing the results and advocating for changes needed for health and resilience for all. Thank you so much, Penny. Again, comments about the community, community engagement, inclusive of those in rural geographies. Thank you for that comment that came in. 
Why don't I go to Don McLean next? Thank you, Don. Oh, thanks. I, so uh, just as a little perspective, I, you know, I would like to point out that NCATS, I think, has already you know, done what it said it would do uh, if you look at the world 15 years ago, you know, uh, sped things up fivefold, et cetera, et cetera. And I can tell you as a, uh, at that time, a basic uh, science investigator who started working on a mouse disease model, then uh, uh, did a first in human study. And uh, before there were, uh, there were CTSAs. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a little mouse guy who never did anything more complicated than a t-test uh, in statistics. And I wrote my first uh, clinical trial grant. <laughs> uh, I would be embarrassed to share it with you today. And But what I can tell you is now with the CTSA, I mean, the tools are there, the toolboxes are there. You know, they're the one of the stenoses in your pipeline was, um, you know, is certainly getting patients on board. And now, you know, there are mechanisms, still not perfect, but, but better mechanisms for reaching across to other institutions, shared IRBs, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, there's a, a, you know, we've already, I think if you would put that slide up at the beginning of the CTSA, we could look back and say, well, we did that. We did, you know, speed things up five times. We, we are including more people and we just need to go the rest of the way. I think, you know, the um, uh, recent example of the um, electronic record uh, database for patients with COVID uh, is an example of what needs to be expanded to uh, other diseases. I mean, you know, if we if we had a if there were some you know uh, sanity and we had a, a a national healthcare system and a single national health record, you know, imagine what <laughs> what we could do. Uh, but uh, I won't won't go much further with that. Um, another uh, stenosis, though, that I see that that has not been fixed is, uh, in my case, it was an investigator initiated trial. Uh, and I think, you know, while we're skyrocketing upward in, in you know, methods for clinical trials, I, I think the funding review uh, process is still, you know, stuck in the last century uh, in many ways. And, and, you know, I just wonder if there were thoughts about you know, it's a system that works, and uh, but it it is really ponderous and and uh, uh, expensive and slow. So you know, that's one thing that that I think was not mentioned that could be addressed. Well, thank you so much, Don, for those reflections. You know, it's interesting to hear from you in that NCATS has largely been successful in its mission. And when I tie that back to the previous comments that we need a friends of NCATS, that message needs to get out there even more clearly and prominently in terms of the work that's happened already with the agency, but yet the opportunities that were afforded to us by NC3, that collaborative that brought together all the CTSAs to share data around COVID, how that can be done more in the future. And certainly that investigative funding review process, how to make sure that's much more efficient. Thank you so much, Don. Uh, uh, yes, we have, uh, we have Gerald Stacy, and then after him, I believe Roy Weiner has a question. Fantastic. Gerald, on to you. Thank you. And you're on mute. There it is. I'm the one with the classic Zoom mistake. Hello. Um, thinking about um, sort of this idea of increase, helping NCATS to increase its presence on the Hill, um, and thinking, Joni, about the, the diagram you used in the stenoses in that, in that um, in that pathway, in that pipeline. I've been working, as you all, many of you know, through, within the CTSA program now for goodness, almost the entire time the program has been around. And one of the primary goals that was set for the CTSA program was sort of identifying those pinch points and finding novel and innovative ways to overcome them. Um, <clears throat> what has been sort of ironic over the past even you know, 15 years is the, that many of those pain points that NCATS and the CTSA program have worked through together are administrative and um, regulatory, and have even and have they 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 have been um, 
difficulties in sort of the management of our programs that have that that you know have really hindered our ability to move as rapidly as we could. And I think we've all done a good job of sort of identifying them, flagging them up. Certainly I've done a good job of complaining about them. And I'm wondering how we can help NCATS to be a better advocate. I mean, I think we can all identify instances where the regulatory environment, even around the management of CTSA programs has worked against the program aims and worked against our ability to efficiently move clinical research forward and, and, and translational science forward. How do we help you, how do we help NCATS to be a better advocate or how does NCATS help us to be better advocates for the sort of reforms in, in, in regulatory and administrative operations that can really, that, that remains actually a significant pinch point. I think that was the greatest stenosis on your slide there, Joni, and I agree that it, that remains a real problem. And how do, we, how do we help you to help inform, to either, how do, to either activate the CTSAs to be better advocates within the Hill, or to, to um, how do we help NCATS to be a better advocate or advisor to our lawmakers? to put a little more realism within our regulations. Because as we all know, there are plenty of places where we get almost stalled. Well, thank you so much, Gerald, for your comments. And I think there were a lot of nodding heads uh, to what you just shared. And having those mechanisms will certainly be beneficial, not just to your work, but to, to the overall goals and mission for the agencies as well. And certainly I think um, the component of even explaining all the things that CTSAs do and how they can move faster may certainly be a role when we're engaging uh, with policymakers and, and others that can advocate on behalf of the agency. So thank you, Gerald. All right, Ron, uh, Roy rather, Roy Wiener, I believe you're next. You're on mute. Mr. Wiener. Yeah, I, I'm Roy Wiener, and uh, I've had a full career, if you will, in translational biology uh, and clinical research. I think we need to no longer de-emphasize, but put forward the progress we've made in the pathobiology of diseases and consider the interventions and the populations that are targets of interventions based on defined pathobiology. And this can cut through the various interest groups of a variety of diseases and focus the resources on the diseases for which the pathobiology is well-defined and the therapeutic interventions can have a logical progressive course. So I think there needs to be some sort of a, a bar that interventionalists can surmount based on the uh, disease, the pathobiology, and the projected interventions, uh, which will become treatment. Thank you, Roy. And do you believe that is missing right now from the goals within NCAT? Where do you think the opportunity lies more well, strongly? If the, you think? the home for this is NCAT. Uh, and uh, emphasizing the uh, progress in understanding the pathobiology and the opportunities for intervention based on the sound science that has been uh, promulgated uh, for decades. 
Wonderful, thank you. That's very helpful. I think that will be received quite well. I also want to bring in some comments that are coming in from the chat and then additional comments that are coming in from the general audience as well. Kelly McVeary, who I believe has had to leave us, left a comment here that talks about the big audacious goals are spot on, so well done, Joni. And I think we need a national dialogue about the pipeline flow that Joni proposed. Do policymakers universally understand the definition of translational? I find I spend too much time defining translational to others. So certainly education that needs to occur in basic terminology that is very core to the work of NCATS. Another question that came in from the general audience, would passage of the FDA modernization bill help NCATS to achieve these goals, considering it would open up more possibilities for translational research that is included in the INDs? And that comes from Emily Trinnell. These questions that are just core questions, we'll feed them into Joni. I don't think we need to stop for a, a response here, but it's certainly going to be integrated. And then finally, another comment uh, that's come from Tamara Al-Hakim, which is really from the perspective of the Sarcoidosis Research Foundation, by what mechanisms will the second goal, right, the all people, the inclusivity of diverse communities, get a more accurate representation of the patient population and research? What is the protocol for expanding engagements with NCATS and beyond? And I know that this is an idea that Joni's thinking about quite well. We talked about that actually in the prep call for this conversation, which is even in the rare disease community, how do we expand the representation of those patients that are suffering from the rare diseases? So thank you so much for that question and comment. And now I'd like to turn it over to Lisa Schill, who has her hand up. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me today. And thanks, um, Joni, for putting this together. I think it's amazing what you're doing. I, <clears throat> you know, I've been really happy with all the work, work that you've been doing with the All of Us research project that's going on at the NIH. Um, you know, your, your work with CPATH, with repurposing drugs for rare diseases. I think there's a lot of great things going on. And my question is, is how can we pull these things together? Um, you know, if, if if there are these different projects, how can they benefit one another? And I think sometimes we need to take a step back and look at these programs that uh, NCATS is working on and even how they can work better with the FDA. Um, I'd love to see that more of that in the future and it's, and it's happening and it's so great to see it happening right now um, in some instances at NCATS with um, partnering with the FDA and partnering with the NCI. But you know, I think we need to see more and more of this. And I think when you talk about going on the Hill, the Hill wants to hear that too. You know, how are all the institutions really working together and how are all the institutions working with the FDA? Thank you so much, Lisa. And that's a nice segue to what I want to ask all of us as we close this portion of the conversation, which is what can we all do together and how can we achieve these common goals when we work in a unified way? What are the opportunities that exist and maybe perhaps what other topics we want to hear and talk more about potentially the role of FDA and, and working on the regulatory front in a harmonized fashion. So why don't we close out the portion, the discussion portion, which has been uh, quite robust. Thank you all very much with that final comment. How do we work together as a community? Are there thoughts, ideas? Okay, Gerard, back, back to you. And I've unmuted myself this time. <laughs> um, I, 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 I wanna say that first that I think this, listening sessions like this are an important first step forward. Um, because again, this is about building trusting relationships. And I think too often um, there have been and 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 certainly much of our regulatory environment is predicated on yes bad actors things like that but how do we engender trusting relationships where we all understand that we share a common goal we share a common mission and we share a common concern for our fellow human beings for our partners as research participants and 
I don't know, it becomes less of a gotcha, less of an adversarial, less of a, um, less of a um, ask first and more of a trust and verify. Mm -hmm. I don't know, we, we sometimes seem to sit on opposite sides of these regulatory issues. And I understand that there is a necessary tension there, but I feel like perhaps we have swung a little too far. Well, the issue of trust uh, is certainly a critical issue when we think about trust in science, but also how do we build trust among the community to achieve these goals, Gerald, as well received. And then what are the mechanisms in order to do that and having listening sessions like these and an opportunity to hear from each other, I think fosters that, that level of trust is um, certainly a growing opportunity. I will conclude the portion of the discussion and thank all of you very much for engaging both in chat, in the Q&A, in raising your hand. This is the first of many tea times. I will do better next time by bringing actual tea. I have a glass of water, not tea, but um, certainly we'll bring tea the next time we have this conversation. And thank you very much. Joni, I will turn it back over to you. Okay, Esther, thank you so much. That was a masterful job and, and such a wide ranging conversation, which has been really terrific. I took a couple of pages of notes, my handwriting, though when I was trying to listen and write at the same time turns out to be really terrible. So I hope <laughs> that I can interpret them um, as we go forward. But I heard lots of, of, of great things thinking about how do we have if efficiency eyes, I think is the word I wrote actually, efficiency eyes, the administrative processes that we have, there are many of them that need it. Um, and how do we build trusting relationships? And I think these both came from, from Gerald. And then the, these ideas of the, the Friends of NCATS and helping to communicate what translational science is, not just amongst us, but to those who are on the Hill as well is so important. So I've, I have a variety of these kinds of um, notes that I've written down and I, I know we're capturing notes and have this recorded as well. So I will make sure that we, um, we, we have these a little bit more spelled out so that we can respond to them in some way and continue to have these conversations. I think one of the questions is, you know, and, and maybe by a show of hands, I don't know how to do this, but um, if you'd like to, if you think these, this has been helpful and, and would like to see more of these types of tea times, I don't know what frequency or cadence they should be, but um, if, if you think that th these would be helpful, I think this kind of a dialogue, just sharing information is also important too and would love um, your input on that. Um, so if you're if you're game, please type something in the chat and say, yeah, I'm interested or or no, that's OK. I, I was glad to be here, but but that's OK. But um, we might still put you on a list just to send you updates on what we're doing. Um, I would also like to point out that we do have a variety of activities that you can get more involved in. We have our our NCATS council uh, later this week. Tomorrow, in fact, is our is our first day of council and then Friday is our second day. And so if you're interested in tuning in for other more uh, in-depth activities of what NCATS is doing, the NCATS Advisory Council is a great way to, to find that out. Um, we also have a, a distribution list. If, if you'd like to send us your email or me, per, if you could send it to me personally, I'd make sure that we get your email on a list and that we can give you those updates. Um, at, we send those out on a monthly-ish kind of basis. So we definitely want to hear from you. Um, and and I, I would love to hear as to whether or not you thought this tea time was useful. It's meant to be a short and sweet kind of period just to get sort of that touch base, but, but maybe other types of approaches would be also useful going forward where we have a longer conversation too at some point. Um, so would love your feedback on thinking about those sorts of things. Um, and with that, I think that's mainly all I had to present. I, I really appreciate you again being here today. Um, I hope you had a nice glass of tea. Um, or uh, I think of golf as a good walk spoiled, but um, um, I invite you back for the next tea time, uh, whatever that may be and whenever that may be. But I look forward to uh, touching base with you along the way. So thank you again. I appreciate you being here. Bye, everybody. <laughs>